This little tiny system is fanless, it's cheap, it's low power. Not only do we get things like two and a half gig ethernet and a quad core processor, but we also get a ton of storage options. And if that's not exciting enough, this has a PCIe slot that we managed to fit a 32 terabyte NVMe SSD into. You can get this little system for your home lab and it will not break the bank. There's a ton here, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this little box may have one of the craziest names you'll ever hear. It's the CWWK CWMBX AS12N-35. Yeah, I'm not kidding guys, that's the name of this. I don't know why they can't come up with a really cool name like mini box or mini PC box, or I don't know, but this is a really cool little fanless system that I'm gonna show you in this review. Now, of course, with any of these little systems, there's always a couple little quirks that we're gonna get into as we go through this, because uh, I've had to actually like send them a note and say like, hey guys, uh, I don't understand what this is. Can you explain this to me? And gotten some responses that are pretty interesting that we're gonna share with you. But let's be very clear. This system can do a ton and we're gonna show you all of that in this review. And CWK did send this unit so we could try it out, but we did have to buy a ton of stuff. Some of which you can see like sitting in front of me to go and actually review this unit. And I just wanna say thank you to all the STH YouTube members who are supporting the STH YouTube channel so we can go buy all the fun things to go put on the system. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so let's talk about the system and uh, probably the number one feature I think a lot of folks are gonna notice right away is the fact that it has a case on it, but it's actually more like it's just a giant heat sink with feet for the motherboard. And that might seem a little bit strange, but let me explain why. If you look at the top of the system, yeah, sure, you're gonna see this CWWK here, but then you get fins and these fins are really there for passive cooling. Now this inside has an Intel N100 quad core CPU. So it is not the highest power CPU by any means. And so you can get by with passive cooling. We've actually been running the system for about two weeks and it hasn't overheated. So I'd say I feel pretty confident in the overall passive cooling. But on the top, you're gonna notice that we have these kind of like eight screw points. And what are those for? Well, there are other options of this. I think there's gonna be an N305 option with eight cores. And when you have that, you probably have too much power for just this kind of passive cooling. And so you can actually go and put fans on top. And I was told that these actually take the 7015 fans. Uh, the only challenge is that there's not really a great place to go and plug them into. We'll show you that in a sec. Okay, so let's get a little bit wild and let's start with this side of the chassis, right? So we get a display port, an HDMI port, cool. We get two USB type A ports, awesome. And then we get a type C port. Now we had this USB C port and just for the heck of it, we plugged in a USB C cable to like one of those little monitors. It was like cheapo 60, 70 buck monitors that are just out there. And we just said like, hey, can we actually just power the single cable USB C cable? And it turns out, yeah, you can. And so with three display outputs on a little system, System like this, you might say like, okay, Patrick, that's good, but shouldn't we have more? And the answer to that is yes. If we go to the other side of the chassis, you're gonna see that we have another HDMI port. That is next to two more USB type A ports. And then we have two network ports. Now these two network ports are Intel I226V, which means that these have two two and a half gig ethernet ports. And one of the other features is something that we get a lot of comments on and that's the power input. So a lot of the mini PCs that we test have 19 volt power inputs. This one is a 12 volt. So you plug in the little power adapter here and you have your little tiny, I mean, this is not a very big wall wart, right? Power adapter. And this is all you need to go and power the entire system. This is a 36 watt power adapter. So it should give you some idea that this is not gonna use a ton of power. We're gonna have an entire section on the power though in the power and cooling. Okay, then we uh, we have this side, which really doesn't have anything on it, but you can actually see the motherboard here. And you're gonna notice that there's nothing like closing this off on either side because, uh, well, let's get to the other side that is way more exciting. And that is this one. This is a PCIe Gen 3 by four slot. Well, hold on. This is actually a PCIe by eight slot, but it's only by four electrically. So I know what you're thinking, Patrick, you have a system with the PCIe slot. Clearly, what would be cooler than getting something like a six, two and a half gig ethernet NIC or something like that and putting it in here. And here is the problem with that. I'm gonna just put this here and what you're gonna see is that it doesn't sit properly. Instead, you could kind of either, you know, take off the bracket or you can move it out of the way or something like that. But one of the weird things about this chassis is that the chassis is like just a little bit too big. Hopefully you guys can see this here, but the chassis is a little bit too big to fit a PCIe card with a PCIe slot. So you might be wondering, well, Patrick, 
fine. I mean, I guess we could take the brackets off, but like, what the heck were they even thinking? And the fun thing is that CWWK, this is not an accident or anything like that. If you saw our eight, two and a half gig ethernet or a four plus two, 10 gig ethernet CWWK system review, you'll know that there is this like kind of weird setup that they have in those systems where they have like this like riser and then they have a kind of custom form factor 10 gig dual SFP NIC. And it turns out that that is the idea with this is that you use those kind of like custom form factor PCIe cards. To me, I'd want those extra couple millimeters just so that way this was a little bit easier to put in, you know? Okay, so at this point, you're probably thinking like, okay, well, this is the most useless slot that you can imagine, but there are actually ways that you can get around it and also deal with the fact that even if you did put a card in here, it's not well supported. It's only gonna be supported by the PCIe slot itself, which is usually not a good idea. So I uh, kind of thought like, what could we do? and What could we put in here that would be interesting? One easy example is, well, let's take this. We have this little QNAP external chassis and you can get a, a little external like SATA to uh, SFF8088 connector. You can go throw one of these little cards in here. And then, uh, you know, if you take off this bracket or whatever, you get a solution that you can go to an external storage chassis. But frankly, I don't I don't know. This, this also makes me a little bit nervous. So maybe you don't want to do that. One fun thing though, and I'll just kind of show you this that I did that I, I think is really exciting. We actually found this cable on Amazon. We'll drop a affiliate link in the description. And it is not my favorite because I think it's a little bit too long, frankly. But something you can do is you can take this cable and you can throw it into the little slot here. And this gives you a, again, and Gen 3 by 4 slot. So the idea was, well, let's go throw some Optane in there. And so we tried a 1.5 terabyte Intel 905P. That didn't work. We tried a P5800X, a P4800X. All those didn't work. We also tried a solid on like, you know, 60 1.44 terabyte SSD. That uh, did not work. But one that did work was actually this Micron 6500 Ion. And so we actually just connected the other end here. And you're going to see that it showed up in both Windows. And we also found it in Linux, of course. And for folks that just want to go and dump something onto a SSD like this, this is actually a pretty useful little setup. Now, I think you do need a lower power drive for this to work because uh, you only have a 36 watt power supply, for example. But the other thing is that I think that a shorter cable would probably give you better signaling, but it's just an idea of how you can use this. Now, of course, the other side to this and why I call this a giant heat sink with some rubber feet on it is because, well, there are rubber feet uh, right here, which is nice because you can put it on your desk and not make too much noise or whatever. And it also just doesn't slip around and slide around. But the other side is that there is no bottom cover. You can see that we can see the internals of the system and we can start accessing them directly right now. Now our system came with a CWWK NVMe SSD and that NVMe SSD is a PCIe Gen 3 NVMe SSD. It's also just a buy one slot. So you're not gonna get like PCIe Gen 4 speeds, five speeds, anything like that. Get the cheapest SSD you can because you just don't have enough performance. It's gonna be a little bit better than SATA, but it's not gonna be like what we're seeing now with PCIe Gen 5 SSDs at like 14 gigabytes a second sequential transfer. Like you're not gonna see that on a system like this, right? It's really kind of like a boot low end drive. Now, something you have to remember here is that this entire platform only has nine PCIe slots, right? That's Alder Lake N. And so you're getting nine versus the eight that you got in the previous gen. And if you look at just kind of how this board is laid out, well, the PCIe slot that's taking four, you then have maybe one for the M.2, you have two, one for each of the two and a half gig NICs, and that's seven of your PCIe slots or PCIe lanes right there. And with only two lanes remaining, you have all the rest of the IO in the system. And that's the reason that, you know, you don't see like a buy four slot here as an example. Okay, now on the memory side, we got something that I really was not expecting. So the DIM here is an SO DIM, and it's a DDR5 SO DIM, which is pretty standard for Alder Lake. You get DDR5 4800. Don't waste your money on faster RAM, usually just isn't worth it. So just get the cheaper 4800 RAM. But we did get a Samsung 8 gig DIM. You can put a 16 gig DIM in here, no problem. And 16 gigs with a low power, like four core processor is a pretty good match. I think eight is also pretty nice. Now, something with Alder Lake N is that you only get a single memory channel. So you only get a single DIM slot here. So that's all you have is the capacity and memory bandwidth of a single DDR5 SO DIM. At the same time, I do have to say, I like the fact that you can replace this and upgrade your RAM later. You may start with eight gigs and then when 
DDR5 memory gets even less expensive next year or something like that, especially older ones, you can go get a 16 gig DIMM and it's probably gonna cost you less than it costs today. I know DRAM prices are supposed to go up, but a lot of times older generation memory tends to become less expensive on the used market. And we're gonna come back to the topic of this replaceable memory when we start talking about the performance section, because I think when you compare this to a lot of its competitors, having that replaceable memory is pretty awesome. Okay, but let me show you the other kind of cool thing you can do with this. Now here you're gonna see that we have two SATA ports and you might say, well, cool, but how do you get power? This little system actually comes with two of these little cables and these little cables come with your power as well as your data connection. So you get both data and power all on the same cable and you can use that in these little slots. There's power right next to the data connectivity. And so when we got this connected, we put these two like super cheap team group SSDs. These things were like the cheapest thing I could find on Amazon. Again, we'll link them in the description if you really want, but these things are not great and they're two terabyte drives, but they are low power. And so by getting these two drives, we could have a mirrored two terabyte setup, which is actually pretty useful. Now, again, one of the challenges of course is uh, is this where, you know, yeah, you have your drives, but they're just kind of like, what are they doing? You're just gonna put them onto the desk and hope that they don't fly away one day. Still for a home lab server, being able to have a boot drive plus two, two terabyte drives and a 32 terabyte drive, that's well, pretty useful just in terms of amount of storage you can connect to a low power device like this. Now, of course we have SSDs here, but you could also have a 3D printed bracket, put hard drives and run these things externally or something like that as well. So if you did want to go get more storage, yeah, you totally could. Okay, now when we pulled the system out, you're gonna see a couple things just to note real quick. One, you do get the Alder Lake processor. This is a four core, four thread N100 processor, which is like six watt or something like that TDP. You also see features here, like there's some extra headers that we just didn't use. But yeah, let's talk about the performance here for a sec, because I think that's a huge story and a huge component of this. Okay, so when we talk about the performance of this, I just wanna point out a couple things. So first off, we did have Windows installed on this. So you can run Windows. You can do things like hook up multiple displays and all of that kind of stuff. Let's get a little bit real here. Windows has a ton of background services and it just kind of chews up, especially these kind of low power e-cores and just kind of uses them. And so one of the things that we saw was when we did that, even if we put everything into performance mode, when we went and ran something like Geekbench, we got terrible performance. But then I wasn't really sure if this was just a Windows schedule thing, if there's something just kind of weird with the installation that we had or what had you. And so what I did was I said, okay, well, let's go and let's look at what if we had an Ubuntu and we installed it in here and like, what, what would the performance be then if we ran Geekbench? And when we did that, we actually got pretty darn good results and results, frankly, more in line with what I would expect. And I just wanna put these numbers into context just really quickly for you. So the first thing is that if you look at this CPU versus something like a Xeon E5 V4 or something like that, you're gonna see that the single core performance is actually on par, if not a little bit better than a lot of the older Xeon E5 V4. So there are a lot of folks that are out there saying like, oh, buy you know these high core count Xeon E5 V4s, but just understand that the single thread performance is now on the old server processors, nowhere near what a modern, just kind of super six watt, you know, low power e-core CPU is. And that's a big deal. Now, Intel has been putting a ton of money into their e-cores. You're gonna see this next year with Sierra Forest when you have over 200 of these cores on a single server CPU. But the new e-cores are equivalent to a couple generations old P-cores just in terms of regular performance. Other things though, that I think folks will compare this directly to something like a Raspberry Pi 5. You can think of this as maybe about two times the speed of a Raspberry Pi 5. I know there are folks that do weird things with power and clocks and all kinds of stuff, but just ballpark, this is about 2X. Now, another system I think a lot of folks are gonna compare this directly to is something like a Zima board. And the Zima board uses a way older generation. I think they were discontinued in like 2016 or something like that, like Apollo Lake E-Core processor. So that is several generations. And, uh, you know, Intel has put a lot of money in the E-Cores because that is the future of their server CPUs as well, right? So just, just to kind of give you guys an idea, this thing is somewhere north of like three to four, maybe even five times as fast as your average Zima board, just in terms of CPU. And the other thing is with the N100, you do get newer, just Intel iGPU IP. So just from a GPU perspective, you'll see a little bit better performance, although you're not really gonna use the integrated GPU on this for anything super fun, like, you know, high-end gaming or anything like that, because, um, well, that would be silly. And so from a performance perspective, there's a huge gap between something like this and an N305 or like one of the other higher-end processors that we look at. We look at a lot of systems 
systems, and frankly, many PCs these days, they are uh, much faster than this, but that's not really the point. This is really designed to be a low power, low cost platform. And for that, I think it actually has pretty good performance. But of course we can have a lot of performance, but if we don't have good power consumption, then a lot of people just won't care. So let's get to that section next. Okay, so let's talk about the power consumption of this. Now, I'm just gonna mention right here that we have a 36 watt brick. Now, a lot of folks always say that like, you know, it's funny when we have a mini PC with a giant power brick. This is, you know, still a pretty small wall ward. So I don't necessarily think this is too bad. And the fact that it's 12 volt, I know that there are folks that are be like, hey, you know, in my little you know, bin of parts, I have a PoE splitter that does 12 volts. So that's super easy to go do. Yeah, there are a whole bunch of really fun projects you can go do with this. In terms of actual power consumption at idle, we saw somewhere in the 7.4 to eight watt range using the included power brick. When we went and pushed the system, maxed it out, you know, we see somewhere in that like 22 watt range when we started adding things like SSDs, you know, now all of a sudden you're in like the 25 watt range. The NVMe SSD, of course, add another couple watts for that. And so just to kind of keep an idea that you have a 36 ish watt power budget on the little power brick, instead, if this is running as a server, you're probably going to see more of that like seven and a half to maybe eight to 10 watt range. You might see some little peaks into 15 watts, but you're rarely going to honestly see 20 watts using Using this as a server unless you start connecting a lot of crazy things to it. And there are probably power solutions out there that are more efficient than this one. Still overall, that's pretty good power consumption. Okay, now with all of these, I like to have key lessons learned and let's kind of get into it. This kind of ends up being this weird category killer in a way, right? So the first thing is that it is fanless. If you want to have a USB fan, if you want to go put a little fan, I don't know what you would do with it, but somehow find a way to put a fan on here. I guess you could, but the N100 version of this, you can run fanless. We've had this thing running. You get temps even under load in that like 50 something degree Celsius range. So it actually wasn't too bad at all for an embedded part like this. And this case I think is going to be polarizing because on one hand, yeah, it runs passively, but on the other hand, you don't have anything on bottom other than just the rubber feet and feet to like make this thing stand up. There's not a whole lot going on here. I doubt it passes EMI, like let's call it what it is. So I think from like a regulatory marking thing, it's a little bit scary. Now, on the other hand, let's just talk about it from a pure performance and capability standpoint. I think that the fact that this is a low power system, you get performance that is uh, easily 2X a Raspberry Pi 5. You also get performance that would be like something like a 4X or 3X a Zima board or something like that, just looking at Geekbench. I, I think that that is pretty darn good performance, especially from a processor that's a six watt TDP processor. We always get questions on adding SSDs or hard drives that are SATA and this kind of fixes that. People always say things like, like, well, if it only had a PCIe slot, so I could add a NIC or I could add a you know, storage or something, well then, you know, that would be great too. And well, I think that you have that with this. But I have to admit when this system first arrived, I thought, well, it's kind of cool, but it's also just crazy silly. And then after we reviewed it, it's like, actually, well, you know, you could do some really interesting things with it, especially if you can figure out how to like secure everything together, you know, like tying stuff down or whatever. I think that that makes this way more usable. Now, I think the pricing in that 200, 250, $300 range is good. The one thing I wish that this had, and that maybe that would make the price go up is Wi-Fi. Like this doesn't have Wi-Fi, but of course, most likely adding Wi-Fi means that you're using another IO lane. You also have things like more cost just from adding that to the bomb and stuff. So I think that there are definitely folks that would want that. But on the other hand, I can see why it's not in the system. I think there are some folks that are just going to go plug in a USB NIC and call it a day. And I can totally understand why they would do that. And then the other thing we always have to talk about is warranty and support. And that's one area that I just kind of wish that CWWK really doubled down on and said, Hey, look, we're going to go start doing just really high end. We're going to have great bio support. We're going to go and you know, figure out how to actually do a warranty system and stuff like that. That doesn't have to go through like AliExpress shipping or whatever that is. I think though that there are a lot of folks that are just kind of accustomed to you know buying from larger vendors, whether that's like Dell or an Asus or something like that. And they're just kind of accustomed to like that kind of infrastructure around it. And I just don't think that CWK is as big of a company and therefore just doesn't have that kind of support infrastructure. But then again, this is being sold as a 200 something dollar device. So I guess maybe that's just part of the deal. Hey guys, I hope you like this review of this little PC. It definitely moves the ball forward in terms of these little mini PCs, especially with the whole PCIe slot and expandability and stuff. I think that this is a really kind of cool little system. I do wish we had a blue version though. Still, if you like this review, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.